Alright, last time we left off trying to get the wires and cables fit to my scoop, so might as well carry on from there. Before carrying on with the front part of the wiring harness, I first need to get these cables fitted. This entire set comes from BGM and seems to be of um, adequate nature. Oh well, back to what I've got and time to get them in place. First up I'm going to locate the ends of the gear cables into the headset clamp, run them along the frame and finally place the opposite ends into the cable adjusters. Back up to the top end and after greasing the barrel ends and lubing the inner wire, I can feed them down to the adjuster block. Next up it's through with the clutch outer case into the socket in the gear shifter and again along the frame and terminating into its adjuster. At the other end, and after more greasing, I can attach the inner wire to the lever and bolt that into place. Now back down to the gear and clutch trunnions, which I've got in a spatula of grease in. Then on with the MB tie rod, a good dollop of grease into the gear swivel and finally I can pop the trunnions into place. After checking the selector and gear shifter are in the neutral position, I pop on the third hand, pull the cables taut and get them tightened up. Not too much as there's going to be plenty of cable stretch with these cheesy cables. In preparation for fitting the rear brake cable, I grease up these lovely stainless top hats from MB and get them into place. Followed by the actual brake outer case. Here you can see I changed my mind about the cable routing. The brake and clutch cables had such extreme bends in them, it seemed obvious to route them behind the motor support. And I also fitted these little rubber gaiters. Another change I made was rather than fitting this complete stainless clamp from MB, I went with this BGM threaded inner brake cable, which when in place makes the whole rear brake arm set up look a lot cleaner. The other end of the cable is clamped into the brake pedal with this smart stainless steel clamp from MB. And now time for the elephant in the room, let's make the brake work. After removing the wheel and getting the BGM shoes off, I found I was left with a very uneven brake shoe, courtesy of my previous attempts at fitting the rear hub, which I fixed with a flat surface and some sandpaper. With the shoes flat, you can see the wheel spins nicely, which meant I could now clamp the cable into place. The inner wire is then trimmed to size and I've soldered all the ends together, which in turn meant I now had a working rear brake, which is handy. Now back to the wiring and time to get the HT lead sorted. First I'm going to pop on the resistor HT cap from NGK into place, marking a new end and then snipping it to size. After fitting the seal onto the lead and screwing the cap on, I can now get the seal on the other end into place. The eagle eyed of you would have noticed that when I last fitted the temperature sensor, I used a simple rubber o-ring to hold it in place. Now I have the HT cap sorted, I can reattach the sensor with the correct length of rubber tubing, scavenged from one of those weird looking waterproof HT caps. With everything now assembled to the correct sizes, I can now fit the whole assembly. Let's get the cables finished. First is the choke cable. But now I'm only going to temporarily attach it, as I know I'm going to be trimming this cable later. The throttle cable now needs attaching. I decided to replace the BGM throttle outer case with a quality bicycle outer case. Oh, and I would have replaced the inner for the slick stainless inner. Only, well, I paid good money for this cable set, so I might as well use it. With the cable fitted and pulling nicely, I can now pop the car back on. And fit the choke lever from this stainless choke and fuel tap lever set from MB. 
Once fitted, I can now work out the correct length of the chug cable. With the length marked, I can cut the wire to size. One thing I do like about the BGM cable set is the inclusion of this little nipple, which will allow me to get the choke cable functioning again by simply soldering it into place at the end of the wire. Now I can fit the stainless choke plate, which should supposedly stop the cables resting on the cylinder head. This is going to need some work. With that on, I can attach the carb and check the final swoop of my cables. They look alright to me. Back at the handlebars and after usual greasing and oiling, I can now fit the solderless nipple onto the throttle cable. So, back to the wiring. I still have one lead missing from the headset, and that's this one. It's the COSO speed sensor for the SIP Speedo. Being as these things are oversized push bike items, I knew to buy the bracket and magnet whilst I was at it. Here is the bracket, which as you can see, simply clamps the sensor in with a little grub screw. But uh, despite messing around with it for a while, I could find no satisfactory mounting position. And that was when I came up with a cunning plan, using this now excess piece of aluminium. The first part of the plan was to drill the grease ball all the way through. Then, finishing the hole so the sensor can nicely locate and coincidentally line up perfectly with the brake rotor bolts. Next was to flip the bracket onto its end and grind down the original Speedo Drive entrance hole, which, coincidentally, had a matching thread pitch as an engine oil level bolt. When all fitted back together, you can now see the aforementioned bolt now acts as an oversized sensor clamp bolt. Bleeding genius. Back to the loom and time to remove all the leads and wires from the headset. Then remove the original conduit and finally feed all the wires through a new sleeve. And I now have a much cleaner looking front loom section. The power of switch wires connecting the brake switch now needs soldering. After which I applied some heat shrink, then enclosed this little lot in some new conduit. With the brake switch wires now complete, it's now just a matter of fitting the switch's little boot and connecting the lot up. Rear brake switch complete. Up at the headset I can simply pull all the wires back through and start to organise them in the lower headset by first clamping them all down with a stainless wire strap from MB. Now for the speedo. It's this minimalist unit from SIP containing all the functions you could possibly want for an old two-stroke. To get it working, I first need to mount it on the underside of the headset top using new fixtures. After fitting a new 12 volt festoon bulb and connecting all the connections, I can now get the headset top into place and get it tightened down. Now for the moment of truth. With the Yoda's 12 volt motorcycle battery, I can get some power running all along my new wires and see if I've got any electricery to go to all the right places. Disconnecting the live and earth from the regulator, I simply attach the matching leads from the battery. And well, all seems good. The tail light and brake light work spot on. What was slightly disappointing was I might have a serious power draw somewhere, resulting in a very faint front light. And pathetic, even more than usual, buzzer performance. But maybe the battery wasn't man enough. I'll worry about that later. The speedo came nicely to life and the fuel sensor seems to work. Anyway, I'm happy with that for now, but finally a quick check of the power wires, as I didn't really want this happening again. And that's a story for another day. Ooh, working electricery. Sort of. With that dreaded pot out of the way, let's keep bashing away, literally, at the bodywork. First off, let's get the leg shields back on, and make sure the cables and wires fit nicely underneath. This time I found it a struggle to get them back on, but with a little force they finally popped on. Now, one of the straps I fitted underneath was a stainless item, made originally a house of cable oilers, and I really hadn't thought too carefully about its position, believing that wasn't that important. But when I noticed this bloody high spot I soon found out it was. Well done mate. Pulling the leg shields off again, I put the strap back on properly, and ruminated on the extra work I'd given myself. With that nonsense out of the way, time to fit something more straightforward. These frame clips from SLUK. These clever little items are going on, so I can pull the component I'm about to fit off more easily at a later date. 
I'm sliding them into place using bits of plastic in an attempt at not scratching the frame's powder coat. With them on, it's back on with the floorboards and now the bridge piece, the component I mentioned earlier. This one is a stainless item from eBay, which doesn't fit at all. So, back out with a grinder and a quick skirt to put the curve into the back edge so it fits against the loop correctly. Once I removed what was actually quite a bit of metal from the bridge piece and fitted the cast of rubbers onto it, it bolted down quite nicely. With it firmly in place and the legs of the floorboards bolted down, I can check the gaps and how well it all lines up. And well, you can see here, I still need to do more work to the leg shield edges. More on that later. For now I've got a more pressing bit of bodywork to concentrate on, the inlet manifold on the side panel. So, if you remember, I was having problems with the curvature off the side of the panel, throwing the manifold out of alignment. Time to try and rectify that by first marking out the manifold on the areas affected. Then, after measuring and marking out the cut line, I get to work cutting out an angled section from the tube leaving a part of the diameter untouched so that I can bend the whole tube over so that hopefully it will sit at a more carburetor friendly angle. Happy with it, I get my aluminium brazing kit out again and start soldering it all back together into one piece. After cleaning it up, I get fitting it back on. Well, it's better, still not spot on, but better. Time to go do something that's boring instead. Let's get this toolbox lid into place. It's from Lambretta Restorations, along with this CASA fitting kit and lock. I fitted the lock with some M3 bolts as a temporary measure, as opposed to the rivets that will be used once it's painted. At this point it became obvious the thing's from India. The build quality is awful and it's a usual bleeding bad fit. Great. With it back off, I get grinding the correct shape into the lower half, and then to stretching the lip on the edge to try and get a better fit. With all that carried out, you can see it's much better. Again, not right, but better. Now seems a good time to get the rest of the stainless choke kit from MB into place. This is a pet cock lever, going through its little rubber frame grommet and not lining up with epoxy fuel tap. Not good. Okay, I've got two options to remedy this. One is to cut the thread down on the tank and two is to boost the tank up with additional rubbers. Option one is out of question, as the tap seals to the tank with a lovely flat surface, and many of flat surfaces don't get on well. So, it's over to the option two, at making thicker tank rubber buffers. With them made up and fitted, I slip the lever back in, using bicycle V-brake washers on the outside, helping to line up this lever with the choke lever on the opposite side. Once in, you can see it lines up spot on. So now it's just a matter of cutting the bar to length, and shaping the end so it locates into a little brass swivel like so. With all that spinning nicely, time for something new. It's this Vespa PX Legshield Toolbox. No idea who made this, but I do know I ordered a bare metal one. We all know about my last experience with painted body parts. It came from eBay, and as per usual, it doesn't fit. And this time round it's even worse than usual. I'm not sure if it was supposed to come with additional brackets or fittings, but when I mark out the top bracket fitting position onto the leg shields and extrapolate the position to the front, the bolts and nuts will protrude straight up to the edge of the horn casting. Nice. So the first order is to drill out the pathetic little spot welds Vietnam and India insist on using and snapping the brackets off. With those off I can get to work trimming the edges to get a better fit. Now I've got a better fit I can carry out a quick test to make sure a full size bottle of two stroke oil fits. Happy with that and after a quick clean up, I've got the top fixings bolted into their new position and after drilling new fixing points into the leg shields, I can get the box bolted on properly. Next I removed one centimetre from all the edges to get a slimmer look, but this meant you lower fixings and unwanted holes in the leg shields. Anyway, now I'm happy with the fit and look, let's get tacking the brackets back onto the toolbox, followed by more substantial welds along the edges and then nice big wheels filling the bolt holes and finally a scurf down with a grinder. Now the main reason I've never liked these toolboxes on Lambretta is it's this very 80s style lock that fits a square hole. Time to get inventive. First off let's get this bracket removed by drilling out the spot wheels. Next removing the inch thick shoddily applied cheap primer and then cutting out a neatly fitting blank. 
As you can tell from the sparking, I rush the cleaning of the parts. Antique welding likes very clean surfaces, but it's all right, I can live with those welds. After a quick grind down to my dirty weld, I can proceed to drill a pilot hole into the centre of the plug and use my ancient old imperial hole cutter, which just so happens to fit the lock nicely. After yet more drilling off brackets, I can now assemble the toolbox, <coughs> minus the hinge bolts, and I like what I see. Good. Will you look at that? Yes, my pedigree chums, that is a chrome-plated, PM-tuning fat mamba. Yeah, I know they're better performing pipes, but if I want performance, I would have bought a small spike. No, 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 this is all about looks, and in my view, no other pipe looks better, except maybe the old Mickex. Anyway, back to the job in hand, I first need to get the cover nuts off so I can bolt this beautifully chrome bracket into place. With that on, I fit the AF ray speed studs and offer the pipe up and get it bolted into place. The reason for test fitting the expansion chamber is because the instructions state that a small section of the floorboard might need removing and as I'm plugging away the bodywork, now seems a good time. So straight off I can't even get the floorboard on as the pipe bracket and bolt heads interfere. So it's back off and time for a little trim. With the floorboard bolted back on, I can now remove the rear coilover to simulate bottoming out the suspension. And wow, not only is the pipe hitting, but the carb don't like it either. So it's back off with the floorboard and an even more substantial trim. And finally I have a floorboard that won't smash into the pipe or carb. Nice. And now back to the second most stupid thing I've done after starting this project. That's my amazing plan to extend the cylinder head cover. After taking gap measurements, I leave equal size marks on the shroud, which is all needed for the plan. And here is the plan. Two identical covers. I'm going to cut the now marked out section from the original cover and graft it onto the new one after removing the flange from it. First things first though, after making a template from the original cover, now I know exactly what size and shape I need to cut out from the new cover's inlet manifold gap. Then it's out with a grinder to cut out the marked end section, then over to the new one and removing the flange from the end and neatly cutting out the manifold gap. And this is where the plan unraveled. After the first tack, I realised these shrouds from TSR are made from monkey metal. The material would just not flow into a nice well puddle. And the SIS stainless filler rod struggled. Or should I say I struggled? Well, it was all too late at this point. So I persevered and finally got a weld all the way round. Another bleeding messy weld. This was such a disappointment. Anyway, back out with a grinder and then a buff on the polishing wheel. And there we are. If it's all right, it's just bleeding ugly. Well, it's gonna to have to do, as at this moment, I have no plan B. Okay, let's hope that's the last arm I need to get the welder out. I'm looking forward to seeing what all this metal work is leading to next episode. I'll see you then. Seven, three, 